Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Hopefully everything is uh, going well for you. It's going pretty good for me. Today we have Alice here and welcome. Please introduce yourself. Well, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Alice. I'm a PhD candidate in uh, Tom Cronin's lab. Um, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I am what I call a marine neurobiologist, which means I sit at the intersection between marine biology and neuroscience. Um, and my specialty is mantis shrimp. Mantis shrimp. Now yes. they are the fastest at being fast, correct? They are the second fastest. Second fastest, fast. okay. Yeah. Okay. I think we've all seen the YouTube videos of the. They're the incredible. Quick Although I wouldn't say they're shrimp. fast in that they um, can like race a cheetah, but they can move their arms really, really quickly, um, fast enough that they can actually smash, say, like a snail shell, or some people say aquarium glass. Aquarium. So it's hard to keep them unless you have like bulletproof like plastic reinforced um, aquarium glass, the five inch thick uh, version of glass for the mantis shrimp. <laughs> now, do you have mantis shrimp in your lab? I mean, do you actually have physically like we they're do. in there? Um, we usually That's cool. have about two dozen at a time. Um, and I think their ability to smash glass really depends on the species of mantis shrimp. So the really big angry ones have been shown to crack glass before, but generally if you leave them alone and they're not too angry, um, they'll be they'll be okay in like a standard like aquarium. That's funny because I was just about to be like, it's just the angry ones. <laughs> I'm like, and you beat me to it. You're like, oh yeah, it's the angry ones. No, what? it's true. There are angry <laughs> ones and then like less angry ones. <laughs> How do you know they're angry? Did you like do a survey on their mental health? And you're like, oh, you can okay. hear them being angry because you'll hear like these snapping sounds and they will, it is them like hitting either the, the glass or the tubes that they live in or God forbid each other. This is why oh, we geez. house them all individually. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
they're not they're not particularly nice to each other. Yeah, or there's there's a lot of of uh, of fish that you don't put in with other fish or other marine life. It's kind of you know bad. It's kind of like having a pet wolf and a pet deer. Yeah, you know, not not necessarily good bedfellows. Um, it's not, not going to turn out well. Um, so let's go back to more of the beginning. Mm-hmm. What got you interested in science in general? I mean, what were your formative years and then particularly mantis shrimp? So I think like many biologists, I grew up watching Zabumafu, um, of all of the David Attenborough documentaries, reading um, the magazine Ranger Rick. And I think that just set up a lot of curiosity about uh, the natural world growing up. Okay, so you and I have so much in common already. Like, I grew up on Ranger Rick. Like, I had a subscription, I think, until I was 18. And then I started getting, <laughs> like, Scientific right. American instead. It's pretty much, I transitioned from, uh, hey, Volcano Doc, welcome in. Uh, and uh, and so, and then after that, it's like, and I also watched in the library on VHS, I watched every documentary that was there. Um, yeah. So mainly Jacques Cousteau, they had the entire Jacques Cousteau collection. So oh, I watched like amazing. All, all of that. And so it, it's, so we have a similar, uh, similar background. Uh, yeah. Volcano Doc wants to know what is a mantis shrimp? So we can segue from your, your background to more of what mantis shrimp are. So mantis shrimp are not actually shrimp. They're not like the shrimp that you eat, although people do eat mantis shrimp. Hmm. Um, it's just not in the United States that I've seen. Um, although people in Europe eat them, people in Asia eat them. Um, but of course, what they are is not defined by their uh, culinary preparations. Uh, they are a group of crustaceans. So crustaceans would include shrimp, lobsters, crabs, horseshoe crab, or no, horseshoe crabs are not actually crustaceans, excuse me. Um, They are their own group, and they're primarily known for being very, very um, predatory uh, animals in the regions that they live, which usually is in subtropical or tropical environments. They're very commonly found in, um, around the Great Barrier Reef, and the oceans of uh, Southeast Asia, Uh, but you can find them in the United States as well. There's a couple species that lives off the West Coast and a couple species that lives along the East Coast. Um, They're really well known for their visual system, so their eyes are really, really complicated, and I'm happy to go way into that because that's (laughs) a little bit of my specialty. Um, And they're also known for being, um, how do I put this uh, gently? punchers they punch and they spear things um it was mentioned earlier that they have the second fastest movement of any animal that we know of and the movement is of this arm that will break shells um, of snails and crabs and like i said sometimes aquarium glass um i hope that answers your question for what mantis shrimp actually are i wish i had a video to pull up immediately um but if you go ahead and google image mantis shrimp it will give you a mantis shrimp. Won't give you a praying mantis, I promise. <laughs> Which are different. They, they are very different. You've already. Although, I know, I'll, I've never eaten shrimps, a man, mantis shrimp. Though. Mantis shrimps are named after praying mantises, mostly because the arms look a lot like what the praying mantises have. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. You reach out and grab them. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I love most. Actually, no, all critters that are in the water, especially the ones that tend to be kind of underrated. When I was younger, Mm -hmm. I always thought a marine biologist was, you know, someone who studied dolphins. Like, that's what marine biologists do, right? Dolphins and whales. (laughs) Um, But when I was um, later along in college, I spent some time at a marine laboratory and um, met a PhD student there who was studying crabs. And I realized you can be a marine biologist and study all of the little crunchies and squishies that everyone else ignores in the ocean. 
and that's kind of how I ended up studying mantis shrimps. Cool. Well, I will bring up some pictures here in just a moment. Since Thank we you. Have, uh, I'll just have to transition briefly over to... Uh, there we go. Anyway, Volcano Doc, I hope that answered your question. Um, I can list fun facts about them for ages, but I know that... <laughs> That doesn't necessarily tell you what a mantis shrimp is. And they're very colorful. They is, can be. They can be. At least certain yeah. species that they put in the newspapers that we're looking at here. Exactly. Um, it, is that sexual selection? Is that like, don't eat me because I'm... Or obviously, you can eat them. They don't taste bad. So, or is, you know, why are they colorful? So the one that you see that comes up with every Google search is called the peacock mantis shrimp, um, mm -hmm. rightfully so, uh, because it looks like a clown. Um, <laughs> the other species, and there's, I believe, almost 500-ish like species. Um, most of them aren't nearly as colorful, although they do, I think they look gorgeous. The reason that they're so colorful is a little it's still debated a little bit but something that's really cool about mantis shrimps is that they have the ability to see or some of them have the ability to see the difference between polarized light and non-polarized light. Ah, yeah interesting and they use that as a signal between mantis shrimps so if one mantis shrimp puts up its little polar polarized flap and it's like hello the other mantis shrimp will know not to go into that hole because the first mantis shrimp will beat him up. Okay. Yeah. And they're pugilistic, so you know they'll actually beat him up. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So they can see polarized light. Mm -hmm. So. And that also means that they're probably usually in in that tropical shallow water where light can actually penetrate. Um, so for at least those that's species. A that's a really good point to make. Um, light, polarized light in water is actually generated by uh, light being scattered by um, small particles in, in the water. But the ability of, of mantis shrimp to, uh, to see the difference between polarized light and non-polarized light is because some of them do have special appendages that reflect light that becomes polarized so their ah. their little flappies literally are polarized um, and this is even cooler um, and i will try not to explain it too deeply because i'm not great at it but mantis shrimp are one of the only animals that we know of that can see circularly polarized light and they can also and they use it in much of the same way yes so and I'm, I don't really want to go into a physics lesson here. Yeah, right. Um, I'm not a physicist. <laughs> uh, but polarized light, for those of you who have polarized sunglasses, all um, photons, right? Photons, both particle and wave. The wave is in a certain orientation. And mm -hmm. so polarized light is when all of the photons of the light or a certain percentage of them are all oriented in the same way. So all the waves are oriented in the same dimension. Um, circularly polarized light, how I like to picture it is that that wave goes in a little spiral, kind of like a slinky. Um, that's about as much as I can explain it because I will get called out for being wrong. <laughs> right, quantum mechanics is, no one understands oh, yeah. it. Hey, Erex, thanks for stopping in and saying hi. Hi. Good to have you here. Um, and, yeah, so the coloring on, on these is just fast. So it's a territorial thing, kind of saying, hey, I'm here, but out. Yeah. Um, so that's their way of saying that. And they use polarized light to do that. And of course, in the photography, they, they can get that polarized light um, in there when they do their photography. So yeah, uh, it's very cool. The fact that they are able to use this very specific type of light to signal 
and talk talk to each other yeah talk to each other yeah right awesome hey Krista thanks for stopping in you're here for a great great conversation tonight Krista this is uh this is up your alley as a bio person she's also a biology teacher so um good to have you here uh any questions about mantis shrimp put it out there volcano doc wants to know what the grossest thing about mantis shrimp is like what what's the gross oh. out remember that book gross out like my kids love those books <laughs> hmm grossest thing about them what is this channel rated <laughs> Just put it in terms of science and everything is acceptable. <laughs> Trust me, I do plenty of sex ed in my eighth grade class, even though I shouldn't have to. All right. I've had many discussions, but it's all done with a very, you know, with a purpose in mind. So you can be a bit vulgar if it's scientific. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I actually can't think of anything that is gross per se, but I can tell you that like many other crustaceans and some insects, that um, there are two reproductive organs. There are two. Two. Yeah. Two. Okay. There's two. Two of them. I don't ask. I don't think that's gross. I do think it's kind of cool. Oh, it's 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 fascinating because we all know that there's so many in in. I think. A lot of people don't realize how varied and weird nature is when it comes oh, yeah. to reproduction. Like, it is just bizarro land. I mean, you look at just the variety in human beings, you know, as most people are suddenly realizing, what, you mean there's not just two sexes? No, it, it's kind of a, it, you go throughout the animal kingdom and you get all kinds oh, of weird yeah. <laughs> stuff. It's just the way it is. Uh, it's, it's more of just, normal than it is abnormal to have weird so yeah. you know so Agreed. that it, it shouldn't be surprising like generally we are much too anthropocentric in our approach to anything humans yep. are not at the center of the world there's so much out there oh yeah it only takes one semester of biology in college really or a higher level in uh yeah. in high school to suddenly like realize after you like or, or just a couple seasons of documentaries and you're just like what you mean <laughs> that fish changes its sex on its own yeah i know hello yeah I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> should have double checked on that yeah <laughs> what you know so pretty soon the surprises don't surprise anymore doesn't make it any more or less fascinating and that's why i it's think it's true i mean you know, i still learn new things about mantis shrimps in documentaries um and i am one of maybe a dozen mantis shrimp experts in the world um mm -hmm. so uh, maybe two dozen now professors have grad students that become yep. professors themselves <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works hopefully <laughs> um so let's talk I always like to talk to, to people on the, on here about where they have been. Have you actually been to like like field research, you know, looking at yeah. mantis shrimp in the wild? So tell us about it's, that. Oh man, so I I call, I'm more of like a pseudo field biologist. I don't do experiments in the field. I go to the field to collect animals sometimes mm -hmm. because I like using a variety of species uh, in my studies. I like to compare what might be different between these ones and those ones in different environments. Um, but I have been extremely fortunate to have visited the Great Barrier Reef um, mm. for field work twice in my career. Um, and we go to a research station called the Lizard Island Research Station. It's part of um, one of the major museums in Australia and to get there oh man so my trips there are always over 48 hours because i have to fly from baltimore to texas usually where the transfer is to sydney to 
Cairns, which is mm-hmm. the um, town where people tend to visit for Great Barrier Reef tours. And then from Cairns, I have to fly to the island that the field research station is on. Um, so it's it's quite a trip, but it's completely worth it. Um, we get to stay in these little cabins, and then I spend the next two weeks um, snorkeling around in the water, chasing mantis shrimp. Uh, some of them are uh, live in the sand, and so when we do that, we um, what we call yabby them out. So we use like a pump and then you know pull them up with the sand and then sift through it. Um, sometimes we will the ones that I work on um, live in a rock rubble, and so we have a little net and then we literally chase after them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the most fun is catching mantis shrimp babies. Uh, so no. these are the larvae that are part of the plankton, and they are phototactic, positively phototactic, and that means that they are attracted to light. And so in order to catch these mantis shrimp babies, um, we suit up in our wetsuits, stand in the water in the pitch black. Uh, we start this after dinner with a <laughs> really, really bright dive light and a bucket, and we just wait for things to swim towards the light, and we scoop them up. It's really fun because we find a lot of other really interesting animals along Hmm. with the mantis shrimp babies um, while we're at it. So it's kind of like, you know, I've done some entomology. It's similar where you get your your light, your UV light out in a white sheet and you see what shows up. And you just kind of. That's exactly what it's like. (laughs) (laughs) In this case, it's just a white light and you're in the water. So it's uh, very similar. Uh, Sometimes. Like, yeah, it completely varies. There are nights where we will get like dozens and dozens and dozens of like various species. And then the next night we'll get nothing. All we'll get are tiny fish. Um, And so it's really unpredictable, but it's a lot of fun, even if it is cold and wet. (laughs) Cold and wet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But usually uh, I can't imagine it's going to get very cold being how close you are to the equator at Lizard Island Research Station. You probably can't get That's that. true, but it, it can't we usually go in our summer, which is Australia's winter. Right. Because uh, that's we tend to choose times when the tide is really, really low uh, to, t- to make our trips. Um, and so it's not like as cold as it is here on the East Coast, um, but it can definitely get windy and chilly there. Yep. First time I made that mistake, I did not bundle up enough. There is also the Lizard Island Resort, which is right around the corner from the research oh, yeah. station. <laughs> uh, so the people who go to the resort are allowed to take tours in the research station. Uh, and they'll come ask us questions. Um, we are not allowed to go to the resort. <laughs> that doesn't sound fair. They can come visit you, but you can't go visit yeah, I mean, the people <sighs> at the resort pay a lot of money to go there. But it's really fun, though, because sometimes if we're taking one of our little, like, dinghies out, the tiny little, like, motorboats um, in our, like, field gear, big hats, like, mm-hmm. shoddy, like, T-shirts and buckets and stuff, we'll see someone on a giant sailboat just, like, cruise by us. It's yep. like, okay, there are two kinds of people on this island, and there are only two kinds. Very little overlap between the scientists and um, the wealthy. <laughs> and the wealthy. <laughs> what, scientists and wealthy don't go together? What? What? <laughs> no one told we you that, did they? <laughs> uh, that's funny. So I did, I did uh, and I've said this before in this year, I, I did a semester at San Salvador in the Bahamas. Oh, and uh, that was my island biology. I think was the name of the course. Uh, so that was the extent of my, you know, snorkeling um, experience. So um, didn't go all the way to Australia. That's on my bucket list is to get over there to down under. But uh, but that was fun. And uh, if anyone gets the chance, like if you're if you're watching this, um then take that opportunity to do whatever that research is where you're going to go snorkeling and go underwater and 
you know, experience that and learn about it because it is worth it. Alice, I'm sure you would agree. Oh, it is absolutely. Worth it. It's incredible. Like I am so thankful for have having had the opportunity to see such amazing wildlife in their natural habitats um, and be able to study them. Um, Volcano Doc <laughs> suggested that we should roll up for a cocktail at the end of the field day. We do, actually. <laughs> so because there's always a big group of us at that research station, most um, evenings we wrap up with um, your drink of choice on the beach and watch the sunset together. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of the field work that, mm -hmm. you know, it's not really the field work. Um, but it's a great part of um, just being with other scientists. Uh, we get to enjoy the view and talk about what we did that day. Mm -hmm. Hey, that you you need that break to just kind of go out there and. Oh yeah. Enjoy yourself while you're there. There's no point in working all the time and never having a chance to just sit back and enjoy. Yeah. Kind of like the fruits of your labor in a way. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're there, you got to enjoy it. Um, yep. Yeah. Most of my field work, because I was collecting a lot of the uh, baby mantis shrimps, happened after dark. So I would have my drink, have dinner with everyone, and then get dressed and get out into the water. Uh, mm -hmm. And so during the daytime, <laughs> I was just helping other people, which made it like kind of relaxing for me. Mm hmm yep so what other kind of research experiences have you had that uh, you that, that kind of stand out to you either in the lab uh with with your uh your amazing mantis shrimp or in the field so i my uh research journey has been um i wouldn't say all over the place that makes me sound unfocused but i've had a good diversity of research experiences. So my very first research experience as an undergraduate, I worked in a lab that studied non-human primates um, and their social behavior. Um, that was a really, really cool experience. Um, and except as the youngest member of the lab, I was stuck with a lot of the grunt work, which mm -hmm. meant um, cleaning, a lot of monkey poop uh so that that was that was like the, the the foundation of my research training um i have worked with a little bit um one of the coolest experiences i had was tagging along um on a trip to study giraffe physiology um I've also spent uh, a few months in Florida at the Moat Marine uh, Laboratory and Aquarium. And there um, I got to work with uh, skates, uh, which are relatives of stingrays. Um, and we studied the effect of the red tides on their, uh, on their physiology and survivability. And so there I've, oh, and I've also done work on, um, on honeybees and their Ooh. brains. Yeah, that was really fun as well. I never thought I'd get to dress up in one of those like bee protective outfits, um, but I did. <laughs> but you did. And I didn't get stung. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, it did its job. <laughs> now, do you have to worry about injury with mantis shrimp? Like if you get too close, will they break a finger? They're one of the angry ones. I mean, their nickname in some places is called Thumb Splitter, so yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm. <laughs> I have never handled one with my bare hands before. I have friends who do. Um, I am not particularly willing to take that risk. Um, there is a story that goes around, hi Mike, if you're watching this, of one of our lab <laughs> alum um, picking up um, a large uh, individual of one of the more aggressive species um, and he has a dive glove on so those are neoprene, neoprene gloves that are usually about what two millimeters thick one to two millimeters he picks it up with his gloved hand it smacks him um, 
he says an expletive, pulls his glove off, and there's just blood running down his hand. Ooh. I'm pretty sure this video is on YouTube somewhere, um, but I don't have the link, unfortunately. But this is a story that gets told um, in our banter trip circles. <laughs> it gets told in the circles. Yes. It's, it's it is now legendary morning. amongst the mantis shrimp <laughs> researchers. Is it, is it like a fish story though? That it start with like, oh, he just he got an expletive, and like later it's going to be like he lost an arm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I might be exaggerating a little bit with the blood gushing down his arm, but you can see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. There is evidence. Yes. And I mean, I think he still has his arm, but I think he's switched to working on fan worms, uh, which are much less dangerous than mantis shrimp. <laughs> still very cool, though, I will say. So this, this gives me like a like a, a Harry Potter reference, where it's like, oh, I couldn't work with the griffins, so I started working with the flobber worms. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I remember that. Yeah. No, That's but it funny. turns out fan worms are a perfect model to study eye evolution in no yeah who to there you go there you go and of course we know mantis shrimp have excellent eyes as you say they really do so as i mentioned earlier they have the ability to see polarized light circularly polarized light um they, their two eyes can move independently of each other each single eye has trinocular vision Think about that. We have binocular vision. This is our field of mm -hmm. view. They have trinocular vision in each eye. Um, they can see um, up into the UV, um, which we certainly can't do, um, and are just overall really, they have some of the most, actually, I'm pretty sure the most complicated visual systems, the most complicated eyes of any animal that scientists have studied so far. That's a bold claim. It is, but I dare any other like <laughs> vision researcher to challenge that. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Right? <laughs> There's someone else out there that wants to challenge you to a, an, an eye uh, showdown. There are ahead. really strange eyes out there, but I I think that mantis shrimp like are definitely at the top of the list in terms of strangeness. <laughs> Um, what's really cool is that these very special eyes of theirs are only in the adults. And so the baby mantis shrimp have very normal crustacean eyes. Their eyes are just like any other crustacean hmm. larvae babies. Um, but when they reach the final stage of development, the adult's retina, which is the sensitive part of um, visual systems, generates right next to the larval one um, and then the larval one disappears but in addition huh. to having two sets of completely separate retinas they have separate visual processing centers as well they have two separate brain regions for the baby eyes and the adult eyes isn't that weird it's crazy it, it, it's almost like they're two different living things um, you know what I mean? All it's like it's happening in that single eye stock, though. Yeah, that's just that's, that is. Crazy. It's not like they make a new eye. The eye is the right. Same. The eye it's is the, the same. But the sensitive part, the part with all of the adaptations, so the retina with all of the photoreceptors, so the light sensitive cells, they generate a completely new one when they turn into adults. So it's it's. I'm trying to think of 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 a. Uh, of something in humans that would be similar. It's not quite like baby teeth and adult teeth. No, not not no. quite. But it, it's more of like like if I had a baby eye and then an adult eye. It's like, <laughs> oh, I've reached that age, this eyeball pops out almost, right? And then another <laughs> eyeball comes in that's more yeah. advanced. It's like, oh, I see I got your adult eyes. That Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. interesting because there's a lot of other um, arthropods, so insects, other crustaceans, that will change their eyes um, between their baby forms and their adult forms. So <laughs> for example, look at the caterpillar. Caterpillar has totally True. different eyes than a butterfly, but they yep. break down, of course, like caterpillar, they, you know, 
cocoon and all that breaks everything down and then rebuilds it from scratch. All of mm -hmm. this happens within the eye capsule that mantis shrimp have. So it's not their whole body. It's just right. within that that piece. Right. Yeah. That's just, yeah, it's kind of bizarre. It is now, are those eye, those bizarre. eyes are, they're, they're very independent eyes then as well. Yes. Yeah. And, and can they, they're like, they can look separately. Yep. But at the same time, they have stereo vision. You know, like you were saying, they can yep. kind of, they can see. So, and like we have one like sensory, you know, it's in the back of our head, right? Yep. Uh, but theirs, they have like two of them that somehow communicate yes. to convey so, what it is. They're an image out in their brain, I yeah. guess. I don't know. So like other arthropods, um, they have very, very similar, um, I guess, visual processing centers to insects. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into the neurobiology of it, um, but it is like having because they, they replicate that entire brain area as well. So at one point in their life, they have four, four uh, brain processing centers for vision, two in each eye. So each eye has the baby retina and the adult retina, the baby um, nervous system, nervous, like visual processing center, and the adult processing center. And the same thing is going on in the other eye. Okay. Did I explain that okay? Yes. It, it's just, okay. it's one of those conceptual things where you're just kind of, you know, envision this. Um, <laughs> <because> envision. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you know, it's just out of the ordinary. You don't always think about this, but um, yeah. especially amongst, you know, in, in vertebrates often and in insects as well, their nervous systems are not, they don't have one central brain. Often yep. it is distributed amongst, you know, yep. several larger neural bodies, I guess. Um, yeah. There's a technical term. I, I would say that they do have, of this distributed nervous system, um, the one in the head is still the decision-making center. Mm -hmm. So it's not like many, many brains. Um, I mean, it is more so than us. Um, but they have um, like a decision-making center in their head. Um, mm -hmm. Even if that decision-making center, that brain area is still the same size as all of the other um, parts of their nervous system that are more distributed down their body. Cool. Right, because, I mean, you have to, ha at some point, you've got to make a decision, right? So yes. you, you kind of have to, a brain to make a decision. Well, you don't have to, I guess. We have... You know, reflexes our, our reflexes yeah. as well which are not i mean if you cut the head just, off of a cockroach a, it'll still right it'll function fine it's just stimulus okay. response you know exactly like fine is fine is subjective it can't like decide to go eat but <laughs> it will still walk it, if you poke it it'll still fly it just won't be great at it um it is very much just like reflex responses all right so what do you do in your lab? Um, I mean, are you like, I mean, I don't know. Just kind of describe what, what it is that you're doing currently. Um, so at the my uh, dissertation research is on mantis shrimp brains, um, which sounds like a punchline and it kind of is. Um, what I do is because I'm really interested in the step in between input and output so input would be all of the sensory um, things so like vision touch olfaction and then the output which is behavior what's in between all of that is the brain right you have mm -hmm. to figure out what all of the sensory information is calculate what you're going to do about it and then feed it back out and so this integration part is what i'm really interested in um, but you can't study that until you know what the brain looks like. And up until recently, no one had looked at what mantis, mantis shrimp brains look like. And so what I do is that I 
remove the brains from the shrimp. So this is a sacrifice that unfortunately does have to be made. Um, and I um, apply different sorts of dyes to them to see what the structures are and mm -hmm. how uh, the structures are arranged and how they're organized can tell me a lot about um, the type of processing that might go on in shrimp brains. Uh, so for example, oftentimes the higher the level of organization um, in um, seen in an insect brain is correlated with how um, complicated their behaviors are. However, if it looks like a mess of spaghetti, it's probably not gonna be a very fancy animal um, for like, if that's like comparing a praying mantis to a silverfish. All mm -hmm. a silverfish does is run around on your kitchen floor. Praying mantises have much more elaborate behaviors, right? They got those big eyes, they got like the poses, and then they got the eating their mates. Um, and although you can't really make a direct correlation, uh, co like causation type things between behavior and structure, what an animal's brain looks like can still tell you a lot about um, what they might be using it for. So like similar to humans, the bigger a certain sensory area is, the more likely they are using that particular sense. Mm -hmm. So the mantis shrimp uh, visual processing centers, each one of them for a single eye, so one visual processing center for one eye, not both, just one, is the same size as their central brain, if not bigger. So that tells you that they are very, very visual animals, which of course right. we knew already, but yeah. it shows that they have a lot of information that they need to be computing. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're probably, you know, they have to integrate that sense with also their olfactory, right? Because they're sensing yeah. the environment, I'm sure, through yeah. the water. And they have to try to get all that together to, you know, see if they want Figure to attack, to run, or, you know, fight or flight type exactly. reflexes. Although mantis shrimp have also been shown to, I mean, there's videos of them. People have them as pets. They're very, mm -hmm. very, um, like, it's very easy to anthropomorphize them because they have so much character. Um, but my one of my friends, um, Ricky Patel, he is currently a postdoctoral research in Sweden. Um, he discovered that mantis shrimp can find their way home. Hmm. By that, I mean they can leave, they can go look for food, and then they will make a straight shot back home. I can't do that. Right. <laughs> I walk three blocks away from my house and I need to get my Google Maps out. Right. But then it's, you have to determine how do they find their way back home? Right? Do they leave a little trail of breadcrumbs, you know, so nope. to speak? You know, do they have some uh, smell trail some, that they leave, or do they have visual cues, or you know? So unsurprisingly, they use their vision primarily mm -hmm. to figure their way home. Um, so they are um, have they they recognize uh, landmarks. So if there's ah. a big rock by their burrow, they're gonna be like, hey, that big rock, I'm gonna go home. They also can use um, what we call celestial cues. So cues in the sky, um, like where the sun is, that's essentially a gigantic landmark. Um, or um, what is known as the polarization pattern in the sky. Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, so we've talked a little bit about polarized light. Um, yep. Polarized light can happen, you know, light can be polarized, reflecting off of things. But inherently, in our sky, there is a band um, of differentially polarized light um, that insects um, have been shown to use to navigate, and now mantis shrimp. So if, there's, if it's really cloudy that day, like completely overcast, they can't use that signal. But because it's across the entire sky, even if it if there's some clouds around, they can use the this pattern to help them navigate their way home. What's even cooler, though, is that without any of these signals, without a landmark, without the sun, without the sky, 
they can still find their way home. Like they've calculated internally their way back. This is called path integration. Um, and humans have terrible path integration. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> yeah, awful. Terrible. If you've ever parked at the mall, you know you have terrible yeah. path integration. <laughs> I mean, there's still a degree of error, but they will still roughly go in the same direction and they will know exactly like roughly what distance to stop at to start looking for their home. Hmm. It's very cool. That is very cool. Shows the the limitations of our own uh, brains it's when compared true. to the uh, I... the 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 mighty mantis shrimp. Yeah. I they a hundred percent have navigation over me. I can't. I mm. my spatial awareness is awful. I admit it. Mm -hmm. um, but I can do research. They can't, or at least I don't think they can. <laughs> Now, do they do they remember things like people type of things or like situations? Ooh. Of course, they have some kind of memory. So, like obviously, like a you know, like, like a Skinner box kind of thing. I mean, they, they I'm sure they have some kind of memory like that. Like this thing always pokes me. Stay away from it. <laughs> well, they know when we come in to the aquarium that we're gonna feed them. Because ah. um, they will come out of their tubes and be like, where's my food? Um, I don't know about their ability to recognize individuals of the human race, mm. but it has been shown that um, they will recognize other mantis shrimps that they've met before. I don't know for how long. No idea. I don't know if their memory is 10 seconds. I don't know if it's a year. Um, but they will have they will retain memories of familiar versus non-familiar mantis shrimps well there you go kids there's your phd topic right there <laughs> yeah someone please work on this it needs to be figured out. <laughs> there you go i can connect you to other mantis shrimp researchers that are looking for phd students i sadly am still a phd student uh, but maybe give it another few years i'll be hiring there you go positive thinking that's one of the things i think is amazing about about science is and, I, and I, I try to tell my students this i'm like you don't have to go that far to realize how much ignorance there really is you know <laughs> no one really knows much of anything it's all just a yeah. bunch of yes you know we can do a lot of amazing things and there is you know some stuff but you just scratch the surface and there's so many good questions um, yeah. That you can ask. Yeah, I was trying to, um, uh, I was writing a grant for my, hopefully my next uh, position after I graduate. And I kept asking the woman I was um, collaborating with, it's like, oh, wait, but do we know this? Do we know that? She's like, we don't know anything. You can write this grant on this giant topic because <laughs> no one has studied it before. And I was like, that's a, that's a mate. I mean, to That's a government. good thing to hear. Give us more science funding. Um, <laughs> but there's so much to learn about the world that we don't know yet. Um, and I, a lot of times I get the question of why, like, why do we care about this? And my response is that one, I think that there is inherent value in, in knowledge, regardless of mm -hmm. what that knowledge is. I think that's really, really important to remember. And two, just because we don't know what benefit it has now doesn't mean that it won't have a benefit in like five, 10, 15 years in the future. Like mm -hmm. I, I know that, and of course I think, but I, I know that like, for example, the giant loss of biodiversity that's been happening is also like secondarily a gigantic loss for biopharmaceuticals because we don't know what these animals and plants and insects have to offer us not that we should capitalize on them because because i feel like that would just lead to more uh destruction but there's there's a lot we don't know and i think there's a lot of ways that we can use this knowledge to help both us and the rest of the world so right you, you, and that rude. that was my grandstanding 
<laughs> yeah. Brew Juice says, one of my favorite things about science is how often it proves we underestimate what is possible. And that is... I think that's a great way of putting it. Yep. And we've, we've talked a lot on, on this channel about the importance of basic research. And like what you said, you don't necessarily know. Like your research into the eyes might someday result in retinal therapy for people. You know, you, yeah, you don't know. I mean, it, it, that's what the basic research is for, or, or maybe a way to use polarized light better. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it, there was some <laughs> of our collaborators developed a device, and I don't know how far this is in terms of like FDA approval, but I do know that they developed um, medical technology using that was bio inspired by mantis shrimp to uh, detect different types of cancer cells because cancerous tissue reflects polarized light differently than healthy tissue. Right. And that's mm -hmm. something that we never would have dreamed of. Right. Um, and one of my favorite stories is of the discovery of GFP, green fluorescent protein. Yep. Some scientists just really liked glowy jellyfish and was like, why do they glow? And had zero plans for what he was going to do with the information, but it was still just like a very cool thing to figure out. He ended up getting a Nobel Prize. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought exactly. at that time? You know, so yeah, the importance of just the basic research and you know and, and you hear about it often you know every year in, in congress they're always like why are we funding this research on the you know the sex preferences of nematodes or whatever you know and you're it's like you don't know what you're talking about if you're asking these questions um and the importance of basic research um because yeah. it's not it, it builds on itself exactly builds on itself yeah plus nematodes have contributed so much to science oh yeah all right so much them fruit flies mantis shrimp no yeah, <laughs> i don't mantis know shrimp. how much mantis shrimp have actually contributed. no there's also a rabidopsis thaliana the exactly the plant the the big five of the model species in mice and, and rats. mice and rats <laughs> I say that reluctantly. I and like my invertebrates. And humans. No. <laughs> <laughs> zebrafish. Oh, yeah, and the zebrafish. Yep. yep. Zebrafish are yep, really, don't really the zebra big fish. You can see through Although them. Although I love hearing about, I guess, uh, new model systems that are being developed. And I mm -hmm. work in a very, very non-model organism. People ask me what my model is, and I'm like, I don't have a model. I just work on the anti Um But, for example... Um, Hydra are becoming a pretty well-established model system. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't just have to be the an like the whole animal. Um, one of the most famous models for uh, neural circuits is the what, uh, what they call the stomatic gastric ganglion of, um, of crabs. And that is essentially the group of neurons, I think it's like 30 neurons, that work together to help um, the crab digestive system grinds stuff up and that circuit has told us so many things about how neurons mod like about neuromodulation about how neurons mm -hmm. interact with each other um, and that is just neurons in the stomach of a crab um ooh, very exciting. congratulations Dark Mark, thank you so much. Appreciate those gifted subs. That's amazing. Awesome. Thank you for stopping in and doing that. That is awesome sauce. I can't express how appreciated. That's just nuts. And congratulations to all those people on their uh, gifted subs. And what is going out to you, Alice? Lucky you. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. I saw him very <laughs> Rex and Lauren and ABC123. Mr. Hamill, awesome. I'm so happy for all of you. And uh, speaking of gifted subs, we do have a game that we're going to be playing here tonight because it is Twitch. So we do play a game here. And uh, so 
you are a marine biologist and you study mantis shrimp. Um, but how much do you know about the Marines, the Army Corps? Nothing. Marines? Nothing. I know nothing. Well, we're, we're going to find out how much nothing you actually know. <laughs> so I got three questions for you about the Marines. Okay. If you get uh, two out of three right, uh, we will do a, another uh, gift sub for someone in chat. So are you ready? Oh, my God. Pressure is on. I am I ready. Okay. So first one, according to legend... The first marine re uh, recruitment occurred where? Where was the first marine recruitment activity? Was it at A, a general store in Dayton, Ohio, many miles from any large bodies of water? Was it B, at a bar called Tun Tavern in Philadelphia? Or was it at a Quaker seminary where they initially didn't realize it was a new branch of the military, but with, within a day, they kicked them out after realizing it. I feel like I'm on, wait, wait, don't tell me. Right? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I steal all my good stuff from other places. <laughs> um, okay. So I really want it to be C. But my gut feeling is that it's B. You are correct. It is B. Yeah. The first Marines were recruited at Tun Tavern in Philadelphia. Love it. So, see, you said you knew nothing about Marines. You're doing pretty good. <laughs> You're doing I'm, pretty I'm good. using my powers of deduction. Awesome. All right. Question two. Okay. Marines are known for their speed and efficiency of deployment. Much of that depends on their very specialized gear. Which of the following about their gear is true? Is it A, the Marine Corps is the only branch that has its own specialized boots, which can easily be removed in water as needed? Is it B, a six inch knife fins and swimsuit are standard issue or is it c that they carry fourteen thousand dollars worth of gear which does not include the night vision goggles i mean i believe that they carry like things that are worth that much i don't know how much time the marines actually spend in the water i have no clue I I don't think it's I don't think it's B. Um, I'm because I, I I'm just imagining that scene in Mamma Mia where there's all the dudes dancing on the dock with their <laughs> snorkel gear and their fins. I don't think the Marines are doing that. Um, I'm I'm gonna say C with A as a backup. You are correct, C. Yeah. Fourteen thousand dollars worth of gear. Ooh, each one? They all have that much on them? Uh, that's what I read. Wait, okay, so how much how much are the army dudes carrying? I don't know. Probably about, you know, five hundred dollars worth of stuff. <laughs> Cause I can't I can't imagine. I've been to the uh, Army Navy store. So it's not that expensive. No. <laughs> the Marine Corps is part of the Navy, though, if you know that. Technically, oh, they're part okay. of the Navy. So that is an interesting little fact as well. I learned while doing my research. All right, last question. You've, you've already won. You've already gotten two out of three. So we can go for three out of three with this last question. Yeah, let's go three for three. You can do it. Person that says you didn't know anything about the Marines. <laughs> so this past year, uh, 2020, um, at Camp Pendleton, there was a false report that a man failed a breathalyzer test to start his vehicle. What did he supposedly do to start the vehicle that was later deemed untrue? 
Right. So you know the breathalyzer, you breathe into it, right, to start your vehicle. Otherwise, it won't start. So we had to do one of those. But one of these stories, uh, well, they're all not true, but which one was the proposed thing that happened that actually didn't okay. happen? Was it A, he really didn't. Instead, he climbed into a Humvee parked across the street and drove that. B, thinking quickly, he found a raccoon and had that furry mammal do the breathalyzer for him. <laughs> or C, he used another orifice uh, to expel CO2 into the apparatus, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Wait, but I love all of these. Raccoons are really hard to catch. Like, they are not very nice. And so I'm going to say C. You were going to say C? Um, remember, they're all false. So it's actually B. Oh, that's that true. was the supposed story. Uh -huh. <laughs> Is that he had caught a raccoon and had the raccoon. Supposedly on the internet, there is a picture of some guy like trying to get a raccoon to do a breathalyzer test. Catching a raccoon is harder than he thinks it is. Right, especially if you're drunk. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the raccoon's also drunk, which could be the also, case. I don't know. Maybe I was drinking want... with the raccoon if that actually happened. I don't think you want to risk rabies for that. It doesn't seem like <laughs> no. a good idea. Which, doing the research at Camp Lejeune, they did have a problem with rabies. And wolf Good. and uh, coyotes, so uh, no going out after dark at, at, in uh, Camp Lejeune. So uh, <laughs> rabies is really scary. Like I know it's something you know, rabies is all around. We got rabies vaccines for our pets, but if I mean, definitely not suitable for work. Watching a video of someone at mm. the late stages of rabies infection is no. horrifying. It's horrifying. Yeah, don't do it. So do Dark it. Mark says that Navy is just Uber for the Marines. According to a neighbor, a Navy friend, of course, and I'm sure the Marines would have something to say about the Navy. <laughs> All those branches of the military. I come from a military family, so I get it. I've been there. So, oh, we had such a we had a good conversation about the Marines there. Yeah. Good job, you did wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. You did and wonderful. Congratulations to whoever gets the gift sub. Yeah, that you're gonna. A bunch of people already got gift subs. It's going to be fabulous. <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, got a few other things I want to, we want to talk about before we, uh, we finish up for the, uh, for the evening. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We're not going to be doing this all night, but, uh, um, uh, we talked about basic research already. Mm -hmm. There you go, Sampton. Congratulations. Thanks for being here. Uh, what other research interests did you have besides like mantis shrimp? Were you like going some other direction? You talked a little bit about it, but um, it, or, and or do you see yourself in the future? Because sometimes people do this, especially when they become postdocs, like kind of taking a right turn and uh, yeah. going a different direction? So when I was in college, I was convinced that I was either going to A, go to medical school, or B, mm -hmm. study developmental neuroscience. Um, and I mentioned that I did a little stint at uh, the Bodega Marine Laboratory, and that basically changed the direction of, of my life because I decided to study marine biology but study marine biology with a neuroscience twist. Um, and so that interest started as trying to understand what, how marine animals, specifically marine invertebrates, sense the world around them. And so at that point, I was looking at labs that studied um, hearing, I was looking at labs that studied sound looking at labs that studied magneto reception so like how lobsters sense the magnetic field um and i ended up studying mantis shrimp which of course have some of the most amazing eyes as i have been blathering on about <laughs> um but now that i'm like at the tail end of my phd i've realized that my my one true love really lies in brain science i am a neurobiologist at heart even though i like saying i'm a marine biologist 
Um, and it is a little bit of a, of a term, but what I really would like to start studying and building my work on as an independent researcher is how um, different sorts of nervous systems, whether it's the brain or other parts um, of the nervous system, change in response to big environmental shifts. So mm. those environmental shifts can be via development, right? So many animals um, have extremely different environments as um, immature um, individuals or as adults this sort of big environmental change could also be in terms of the microbial communities or the light environment. And so for me, I would love to know how nervous systems either change in response to this or in some cases stay the same despite having these major environmental changes. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And I think there's, there's a lot of precedence for that kind of uh, research and thinking yeah you know even in humans it's always you know yeah how much does your brain change you know even mine you know minor changes throughout your life yeah um, i remember growing up you know it was always you know you don't make new brain cells so you better you know treat the ones you got you know right but lo and behold later they're like oh yeah you have stem cells in your brain and they do produce new brain cells. It's like, oh, yeah. it, you know, it, and yeah, that was. Of... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you're switching out receptors and increasing them out of this receptor or this neurotransmitter. Then you've also got neuromodulators and then more at, on a bigger scale, neuroplasticity. It's, mm -hmm. it's a dynamic system. And I find that really, really cool, especially because regardless of the changes that happen and go on usually behavior tends to be consistent the output is still within the parameters of what an animal should be doing um, and i just find that really fascinating um, ideally i would love to continue working on invertebrates because those are my one true love i love strange weird tiny animals <laughs> Uh, I really do. I like. I I am the person who will see a little stink bug in my room, catch it, put it in a large jar, look at it for like a few hours, and then let it go, because um, they're just so interesting. Yep, and, and I think that is something awesome that you know you manage to to hold on to, whereas. You know, a lot of kids, especially by eighth grade, have lost that curiosity. So I think everyone has their kids go through that stage where you they want to like keep it and put it in something and just kind of look at it. And then, of course, yeah. they want to let it go because they're worried about it, whether it's a spider or a yeah. stink bug. Um, and, you know, and, and for some reason, a lot of people lose that innate sense of curiosity, especially by the time they turn 13. Um, because you become more interested in other things, but being able to hold on to that, that passion is, uh, is good. Yeah. I love it. And, um, I think I, I completely agree because other, I mean, other things come into your life. There are other really like interesting things out there. Um, like I know that I, you know, would also get distracted by television and by video games and by books. But the thing is like all of these things can intersect a lot. So you first mm -hmm. found me because I was a guest on um, Enceladorus, Enceladorus's stream because um, we were playing Subnautica and I was giving yep. marine biology commentary on it. A lot okay. of this sort of curiosity can be dispersed to everything that you're interested in. Um, and I, so I think a lot of it is just about reigniting that, um, making people remember why these things are so cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, uh, do you ever read, especially like speaking about books and distracting you? I mentioned it before. My kids loved the, the gross out series of books and we might still have some in my house somewhere. And, uh, I don't know if, uh, you've ever seen those, but it's basically just those bizarre and interesting animals. You know that do like gross or really weird things. My kids loved reading those. 
Um, so if anyone's ever looking for good, you know, nonfiction science for kids, those are those are great books. Um, I don't think I have those, but I'd love to read them now. <laughs> What's really funny though is that when I was a kid, so I, I you know, loved Ranger Rick. I loved watching these documentaries. Yep. Um, but I was terrified of insects, which is ridiculous because right. I end up studying in like arthropods anyway. Um, my mom has so many stories of me like running screaming out of a restaurant because there's a fly on the wall. Um, and it, it's absurd because at one point in my life, I studied jumping spiders a couple years ago. <laughs> And my mom literally laughed out loud and was like, you're joking. And I was like, no, I'm actually studying them right now. <laughs> she probably thought that was funny. It's like, it would be like my youngest daughter suddenly deciding she wants to be a chef that cooks mainly with broccoli. <laughs> It'd be funny. And Brood Juice, if you want Subnautica Friday nights, I'm still doing a playthrough of Subnautica uh, with Vinny HD. Uh, that's still ongoing. So stop in then. We have a good time. <laughs> but some people like the soft and cuddly research creatures and other people I like the squishy crunchy like ones. The, the, squi the crunchy on the outside, squishy on the inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um I often ask people, I'm like, "So how is it that you can eat shrimp but you can't eat a maggot?" <laughs> People eat maggots. I know they do, but I'm talking about <laughs> general people in the U.S. Because <laughs> if true. you think about I know, it, I knew someone. They're very who similar. Used it, the, yeah, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing, but it's like basically the same thing. I did know a guy once though that would not eat any seafood outside of fish because he was, I mean, not totally wrong in this. He's like, they're basically insects, and I was like, I mean. Kinda, but they're delicious. <laughs> you just have a prejudice against insects, I mean. Exactly. I mean, roasted crickets are not bad if you've ever had the chance to try them. I haven't had crickets. I have had scorpion and I've had Ooh. cicada. Those are the two insects I've had. The scorpions tasted like Doritos because essentially they're just crunchy and in like Dorito, Dorito you know, uh, you know, crust. <laughs> um, cicadas, eh, they're a little bit strange. Um, I think it was just yeah. how they're prepared. But I'm kind of, I mean, because we're going to get that huge brood of cicadas in the next couple months, which I'm so excited about in the DC, yep. Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia area, we're supposed to get brood 10, which is one of those broods of cicadas that comes out every 17 years. And I am so excited. I think the Washington Post actually put up a recipe for cicadas. Okay. Because um, they'll be everywhere. Yeah. The only thing I would be more concerned about than like eating them, because basically it's kind of like shrimp. They almost taste like whatever you cook, right? Hmm. If it's teriyaki, okay. it's teriyaki, right? If it's, you know, lemon garlic, it's lemon butter garlic or whatever. But I'd be more worried about the insecticides or other, you know, things like that, the chemicals that might be on the cicadas from where they mm. emerged from. That would be my bigger concern than the actual flavor or unappealingness of eating them. That's a really good point. Maybe you just have to collect them from like a more wooded area away from cities and agriculture. And wash them. Yeah, and wash them. Yes, yeah. that's key. That's fair. I mean, that's important yeah. for anything you eat. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And wash them okay now that we've just grossed out oh actually you know, I, <laughs> everyone that was here they're like oh my god no one commented on that though i'm surprised that entire conversation about eating uh you know cicadas i forgot who it was there was someone had this this postulate and i always think about it that one of the first things that humans do when they encounter a new type of animal is eat it <laughs> That doesn't surprise me. Honestly, no, <laughs> I'm a little surprised that no one in the chat or you has asked me if I've ever eaten mantis shrimp. Because that's one of the first... I usually get two questions. I wasn't going to go there. One, <laughs> oh. <laughs> one, have you ever eaten mantis shrimp? And two, how big are they? Those are the two most common questions I get asked. Mm -hmm. um, 
So answer to one, yes, I have eaten them twice, um, once in Japan and once in at in Australia. Um, it tastes like you know shrimp, except the texture is a little softer and it's a little sweeter. Hmm. I didn't love it actually, um, but apparently it's really good stir fried. But I haven't had it prepared that way. And two size wise, they can go from really really itty bitty um to the size of your forearm so mantis shrimp depending on the species can get really really big and those are the ones that you don't want to pick up with your hands oh oh, oh no i can't imagine yeah. so they almost get up to like lobster size basically oh yeah sometimes bigger mm. wow that's the one that i ate in australia was one of the really big ones that you dip that in butter it's got to be good <laughs> anything's good, good in butter uh-oh Jess says that there's a raid coming. Ooh, hey Jess. It must be the D and D raid from Lantern Noir's, uh, uh, you know, channel there. So, as I said, they were playing some good old D and I was watching that earlier before I came up here for this stream. So I'm trying to build a computer in my basement because this is generally my daughter's room, her computer room. So I'm trying to build another one so I don't intrude on her because she's, you know. 13 and she needs her space um <laughs> but things have been been crazy because my wife broke her ankle over the weekend oh no yeah and like three bones right and so my like my the whole family life is just kind of like flipped on its head a little bit and so yeah. things are a little bit crazy so like i was gonna finish building that computer you know the last couple of days but you know things get piled up and whatever but yeah. you know it's not the end of the world heck it's just a computer um, yeah. but that, that is an ongoing process. So at some point in this stream, here he is, Lantern Ooh. Noir. Lily. Here he is. Sorry, hey, Raiders, welcome in. We oh. are talking about Mantis Shrimp. Thank you for the raid, everyone. How was D and D? Um, did anybody die yet? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome there, Raiders. Tell me all about the DD. We want it. We want to know. We want to know. Hey, thank you for the follow, Larius. Appreciate it. Alice is telling us all about the awesomeness of the mantis shrimp. They're pretty yeah, cool. I was there for your character development. I was I was there for that when you were first developing. Well, I'm, I like the librarian uh, barbarian. That, that was probably uh, one of the more interesting ones that I came across. So, uh, <laughs> I hope you guys had a great. I, I will be checking out more of your D and D streams because uh, Lantern Noir does a great job um, of uh, of doing D and D. If you haven't watched one yet, Alice, you should. If you're in the D and D, I think I will. Sounds like a good time. He's he's a good storyteller, and I like how he does the D and D because it focuses on the story, um, yeah. with of course good rules for initiative and things like that uh, to keep it lively. Um, so <laughs> you you broke <laughs> <laughs> Be nice to him. <laughs> he he's been a guest on this show before. He's been on here before, so we uh, we appreciate him. Uh, <laughs> I was humbled. <laughs> well, I'm hopefully not humbled too much. Um, <laughs> you, I know you work very hard on, on what you do and trying to keep things going on your stream. So thank you for the follow, Max Morris, and the bits. Thank you for watching Hazel Soros Rex. Uh, oh, thanks, Lofo. In the follow. That's awesome. <laughs> she would fit well into a D&D group. I can see that. Your favorite crustacean. All right, you got another fan in chat. It's Love Nib it. says that's that's favorite crustacean there. So uh, you got another fan. Um, um, I'm I'm a fan as well. I'm I'm growing more and more appreciative. Um, We've been learning some very interesting facts 
and Alice is so full of these little facts that it's 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 amazing how many that there are. Uh, so, any any other facts that you want to share since people just got here about Mantis Shrimp Palace? Ooh, so I shared my vision facts. I shared my polarization facts. Um, so one thing about their punch is that the ones that can hit the hardest, the force of that, one, can create a cavitation bubble, and two, can be comparable to the force of a twenty-two caliber rifle bullet. That's how hard they hit. Check out that fun fact. Hmm. That that is a fun fact. This is why you don't want to handle them with your bare hands. Yeah, I wouldn't want to. I, mean, I don't even. I don't even like to. Uh, I, don't, I don't even like to uh, handle anything like a crustacean with my hands. Usually, uh, spiders I can do because usually I'm just actually no, I just squish them with a newspaper. Oh no! But, <laughs> oh no! I mean, okay, here's a trick for um, that you can use with crayfish or crabs. Okay. Um, I do this with my students um, because we have a crayfish lab in our comparative physiology class. Because um, animals with claws, like lobsters or crabs or crayfish, have a really hard time moving their muscles this way, all you have to do is pinch their arms up mm. and then they can't pinch you. So I would put your hand, your fingers right below where their claw arms start, push them up so they go from this to this, and you're good to go. Cool. <laughs> 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 Works the same on me. Funny. <laughs> I, I will add, like, when I was a little kid, I used to catch crayfish all the time. Um, mm. So that was just my hobby. I would just go out and, and like catch crayfish and then let them go. So uh, that sounds like so much fun. Because I grew up in Virginia, so I'd be in the creeks in Virginia, just out there collecting crayfish. Of course, that's where I developed my uh, my social skills by myself <laughs> in the woods <laughs> with crayfish. <laughs> with crayfish. Uh, not necessarily oh, okay. the best Low way. Is crawfish and crayfish are the same thing, I think. I think that's Yes. Cool. And crawdads and I don't know, there's probably different species. But uh Oh yeah. But I think broadly those that those names uh, apply to all of them. <laughs> They're talking about Those are also food. delicious. I love a, cr a crawfish etouffee. Mm. You know, I've never really gotten into like crawfish foods they always seem like so much work i really like foods that you work for hmm. so i like crab i like crawfish i like oh those are all crustaceans i like pistachios you got to work for pistachios mm -hmm. i will say that's we're talking about food something else interesting um that i learned i went to china in like 2003 mm -hmm. and one of the interesting things was they don't a lot of times they didn't peel their shrimp you just ate it shell and all mm -hmm. and that was just the way it was served and it was seem it was deemed healthier that way just because you know you had the so it like you just got used to eating it with the shell on um so little you didn't have to work for it then you just ate it yeah i think that depends on how you cook it because if you fry it like mm -hmm. crispy enough it it basically is like yeah it cooks really well and then everything is just crunchy instead of just like getting stuck in your mouth um, right yeah mm, that sounds really good right the fried uh, shrimp you eat it all the crunchiness makes it better exactly Ex i love i love some crunchy foods in sweden <laughs> they do um crawfish feeds which is surprising for at least it was surprising to me in some place in scandinavia but. yeah you would think all they would have is just you know various varieties of fish no, it's, it's like a big summer thing. And then you can get like, if you go into the party stores, they have decorations specifically for these crawfish feeds. Huh. Wow. Yeah. To learn something new. Mm -hmm. um, and Celadosaurus asks, have I been to Sweden, Alice? Yes, I have been to Sweden. I've been to Sweden twice. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's a reason. What is the reason? 
<laughs> she's she's asking for a specific. Did I like it? I did like it. Uh, the food was okay, um, but I liked Sweden a lot. <laughs> what is going on in the chat box? <laughs> Are they going to Sweden? She texted you. You guys are going to have to connect oh. and talk about it. Oh. <laughs> Loaf bone, you're not being that bad. I, I have to, I, I will say like a lot of people are here that I've been to this stream before. I, I usually, I often have my students in stream. So that's why it's usually for like, oh my God, that the mods on this stream are crazy. I, a lot of times my, I teach mainly eighth grade and they'll, they'll stop by um because they stalk me and they hunt me down and find my stream um so uh that's why i totally keep it you know pretty clean if we talk about if we talk about dirty stuff as we mentioned earlier it'll be in a scientific concept for educational purposes <laughs> <laughs> because we know eighth graders are very you know interested oh, yeah. in all things having to do with certain things yeah. <laughs> Worst moderation on Twitch. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Bill. <laughs> Dat hormones. Yep. But of course, it's one of the things you miss out during COVID teaching, right? You don't, you don't, you don't get that. They're just not as open asking those questions because they could be in their house with their parents, and so they don't feel as open to asking questions of a teacher that they wouldn't ask in front of their parents. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, you know, they'll, they'll, kids will ask certain questions that, uh, you know, they won't at home and in school. Yeah. You got some questions there. Can you, you see those, Alice? Yeah, I see that. Okay. So, um, Encelidosaurus asks, what is the most what is my favorite unexpected fact about mantis shrimp? Um, I okay, I know that I talked about this already a little earlier, but one of my favorite facts is the fact that they completely rebuild their eye between their larval stages and their adult stages. That is bonkers to me. Um, and would I get a mantis shrimp tattoo? Asks Slow Phone. Uh, my mother has said she would disown me if I ever got a tattoo, uh, so probably not. I'm not lying. She probably would actually disown. Me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Jesse, we can talk about this later. I, I went into it in depth in the stream earlier, but yes, we can talk about this. <laughs> I don't have a mantis shrimp recipe, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty. <laughs> and that was a question from uh, eRenter uh, oh, okay. about whether or not I had the best, whether I had a really good mantis shrimp recipe. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, I did share out with my colleagues the other day a uh, cicada recipe. So we're talking about that. Amazing. <laughs> They're like, oh my God, can you believe this is happening? And I was like, hey, here's a recipe. <laughs> yeah. um, Enceladosaurus also asked, how long do mantis shrimp live? We have no idea. Oh. Yep, don't know. No clue. They live no until you eat them. They managed to raise them in captivity from birth to death. I mean, plenty to death, but it's really, it's notoriously difficult to raise, raise them in captivity. Uh, hmm. So no clue, zero idea. Wish I could tell you, wish I knew. Okay. Um, and why is it so hard to raise them in captivity? So like a lot of other crustaceans, they spend their larval stages in the open water as part of the plankton. Um, and that is, an area of an environment that we don't know a lot about, especially in terms of what they eat, what different um, concentrations are of various compounds, the oxygenation. We don't know whether or not the movement contributes to their development. We That's just something that is almost impossible to study. Um, and so if we don't know that, we can't replicate these same um, things in the laboratory, uh, which means that when we do somehow magically get baby mantis shrimp, they, you know, 
there's a lot of eggs a lot of them will hatch and then they'll just die off like stage by stage which is really unfortunate but we just can't provide the same environment that they would have in the wild so it's unfortunate um you... oh thank you loaf bone um and whether enceladosaurus also asked if this is true of a lot of marine life i think marine life is extremely extremely diverse um so i think that's that's hard to say but a lot of aquariums have pioneered methods for um raising say jellyfish and seahorses and that's not something i would recommend anyone do at home but at aquariums they have the resources mm -hmm. and the types of care that um these animals uh could use to you know have a happy life in captivity um so well thank you love bone i'm not sure if i would be great at a water world but <laughs> <laughs> and enceladosaurus how do mantis shrimp communicate where jesse where were you like half an hour ago um, just playing dnd &D. we went over that <laughs> that's that's true you're right you're right <laughs> um that is a hard question to answer um but we do know that they can communicate um, by flashing uh appendages that reflect polarized light or circularly polarized light and they use that as signals as warning signals to other mantis shrimp no don't apologize it's totally fine <laughs> <laughs> but i hope i answered your questions i love getting mantis shrimp questions <laughs> <laughs> Loafbone said that's how he communicates. And yep. do they have polarized light mating displays? I don't know if I would call them displays, but if you want really cool mating displays, highly recommend people look up um, the displays of sea fireflies. So sea fireflies aren't insects. They're actually crustaceans. Um, I love crustaceans. I will talk about crustaceans all day long, not just mantis shrimp. Um, but they are bioluminescent and they make patterns in the water to uh, as mating displays um which is very very cool <laughs> ask more <laughs> <laughs> i think it's we've gone through a lot of it already right. actually <laughs> we've gone through a lot of that um so we are going to be wrapping things up here in a little bit um was there anything else that you wanted to talk about tonight, Alice? Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, but uh, I think there is a link in the chat. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I'm always available for science questions. Um, and I had a great time tonight. Thanks for having me. Yep, well, thanks for being here. Yeah, Navad will be up on uh, YouTube later i don't know if i'll get it up there tonight um i might want to edit it up a little bit uh but yeah it'll be up there it will be up there yeah you no, missed the, bill, you missed the I quiz uncle bill usually you're here for the quiz and you miss it this week so i did i passed yeah she she won it, <laughs> it was awesome i didn't think i was i thought i was gonna get zero out of zero yep she proved she knows a lot about the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is all I will ever know about the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Jess, remember when I asked you about all the questions about Sicily? She did good, too. That was a, that was a funny <laughs> one. Wait, what does Sicily have to do with astrophysics? Well, that's where in mythology, um, the Titan... Enceladus was ah. underneath Mount Etna. So see the Got connection it. there? It yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Hey Butcher Riding One Two Three, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate that. <laughs> it was so hard. <laughs> I don't think it was that hard. It's supposed to be hard but fun. All right, so we're going to raid someone. I'm not sure who yet, but we'll raid someone. Uh Let's see, is Lantern Noir still streaming? Um, 
That'd be funny if we went back to him. No, he's gone now. All right. Um, we could go see, check me out. She's uh, doing uh, building routines and hacking habit loop loops. Um, it's a wellness stream. Uh, Harry Horror Show is doing Irish monster stories. That'd be funny. Check out Harry Horror Show. And then there's Decaf Jedi is doing Retro Police Quest. So unless someone else has another stream that you'd like to recommend. Um, and uh, we'll do that. So please hang out and I'll set that up and we will hop over. Uh, and uh, let's see. We will go to uh, Harry Horror Show, I think, tonight. So his he usually streams about bizarre stuff, completely different from science. That's why I, I, I like going there sometimes, the complete non-science. Yeah, Mr. H is, is uh, live too. I don't know if I know Mr. H. Is that Mr. Horologist? So if you want uh, watch repair. Let's see, go here. And let's see. And we will go to Ray Train, all aboard. Here we go. Uh, we will, let's see, where do we want to go? Let's go to, uh, let's actually go to Check Me Out. Let's do some health and wellness. Get our mental health in order. That's where we usually go. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, being a great mod, uh, Dark Mark, um, and being here uh, for that. And thank you everyone for the follows and the support. Friday, we will be doing a uh, stream with Subnautica with Benny again. That'll be Friday. So that's the next stream. And next week's going to be more earth science and talking about precipitation. Ooh, that sounds fun. Yep. <laughs> All right. How is your stream today? Welcome, Raiders. It's good to see you all. Hazel Soros, Darkmark, Admiral. 